Hey Vineyard family, today I have the privilege of introducing to you our guest speaker for our BYOB series. As we are digging into learning to study the Bible, we felt that Dr. Daniel Gilbert, who teaches Bible study to seminaries, could help us grow in better learning to unpack God's Word. Pastor Andy and Dr. Gilbert actually went to seminary together and took many of the same classes. Over the years, Dr. Gilbert has dedicated his life to teaching theology and empowering people to go deeper in God through studying the Bible. He has pastored churches in two different countries and has been a professor at two different seminaries, King's University in Los Angeles and currently our very own Regent University. He is married to his college sweetheart, Mary Beth, and they have a daughter, Maria, who is a student at Virginia Tech. Would you please stand to your feet and put your hands together and welcome Dr. Daniel Gilbert. Praise the Lord. It's such an honor to be here today. Please be seated. And as you bring your own Bibles, please bring out your Bible. <laughs> we, uh, if you don't have a Bible this big, then you're not spiritual. Let me ask you a question. Who has ever felt intimidated regarding reading or studying the Bible? Let me see your hands. Almost all of us have. Sometimes we, we, see, a, we see in our mind's eye a huge Bible, and we go, there's no way I can even understand this, or, or where do I even start? I haven't even read a 100-page book in, a, in six months or six years. Who's ever felt that way? This is such a great series Pastor Andy has uh, chosen to lead us in. And here's another study Bible. Again, it's three, two inches thick, and it can be intimidating and scary. But today I want you to know it's not scary to read the Word of God. It's a love letter from God for you and me to understand it's not difficult to understand, but there are universal principles for us to understand the Word of God. So today, we're going to learn the key principles, universal principles. The Bible says, you know, this is a little bit more readable, right? A little bit more relaxing. We're going to learn about how to study the Bible and read the Bible properly. It's so important for us to understand the Word of God. It's not that difficult. The translations that, that you use, the NIV, is a very readable text. And so that's why we, have, uh, you, we use that here at Vineyard. Now, those who may not have a Bible, I don't want to embarrass you, but I want to encourage you. We have free Bibles for those that don't have a Bible, so you can follow along today and then every day, every Sunday. Who does not have a Bible? Lift your hands. There's one over here. There's one right there um, in the back, and there's a couple others. Please keep your hands up because our, our servers will come and give you a new uh, uh, NIV Bible for you to follow along. Isn't that wonderful? People, we uh, y'all do a great job giving out Bibles. It's so wonderful. So again, who's ever felt intimidated by the Bible because we don't really know where to start? We don't know where to read or how to read it. I mean, do we view the big book with fear in the sense that we say to say, "There's just no way." I can read through the entire Bible and even understand it. Most Christians don't know how to read the Bible or study it, much less. So they just don't. Matter of fact, recently in the latest American Bible Society and Barna Group, as well as Cultural Research Center of Arizona Christian University, did research on how much people read the Bible in America. Their main focus is Christians, but it's a general study. Do you realize 11% of, a, of the adult population, 11% read the Bible daily. 5% read the Holy Word of God four to six times a week. 9% read it two or three times a week. And another 9% 
only once a week. About 8% read it once a month. And another 8% read it three or four times a year. Now we can understand why the church in America is failing. Now we can understand why Christians are not maturing in their faith and being tossed to and fro with every wind and wave of doctrine, false doctrine that is, and practices. Now we can understand why uh, Christians don't know what the truth really is and fall into the philosophies of this world instead of the, uh, the truth in Christ Jesus alone. That's why we can understand when we're not in the Word daily to refresh our soul and to get to know the one who wrote this for us, why marriages are breaking up, why children are rebelling and running from the church. The church has failed to teach you how to read and study the Word of God with purpose and correctly studying the Word of God. That's what this series is all about. This series is all about understanding the truth of the Word of God. How we need to help Christians not only fall in love with the Word of God, but to get into the Word, to get into it, to soak in it, allow the Holy Spirit to minister to us as we read the Word with purpose. To allow the Word of God And the Holy Spirit to inspire us, to speak to us, to strengthen us, to comfort us, to direct us, to correct us, and to train us into righteousness as we learn in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. Oh, you see, the Bible is the word of truth, the word of God, the Holy Scripture, all different names of this glorious book. That God brought together for you and me to read, to study, and to allow by the Holy Spirit to change us. Today, we've been learning from Pastor Andy this series of BYOB, Bring Your Own Bible, in which my lovely wife, who always reads her Bible, who brings her Bible everywhere, Forgot to bring her Bible today. <laughs> and uh, I joked with her about that. That's okay. I have, I have an extra one for her for the next service. But Pastor Andy, what a great man of God he is and what he's doing great here at Vineyard Church. We've learned over the last several weeks about the importance of building our lives on the Bible and why it's so important why we can trust the Bible today and how the Bible changes us. And I know all of you have been learning and growing into this. After speaking and praying with Pastor Andy, the Lord has led me to bring the message of how to correctly handle the word of truth. How to correctly handle the word of truth. So let's stand right now and let's begin to read the word of God together But we're going to start, this is the key verse, but we're going to start. Let's stand in honor of the Word of God and read 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 14 to 19. You don't have to read it out loud, just listen uh, listen and follow along in your Bibles, your real Bibles. (laughs) I love you holding that Bible in your hand. Listen to the Holy Word of God. This is Paul writing to Timothy. Keep reminding God's people of these things. Warn them before God against quarreling about words. It is of no value and only ruins those who listen. Do your very best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who does not need to be ashamed and who, listen, correctly handles the word of truth. Say that phrase with me correctly handles the word of truth. Verse 16, avoid godless chatter because those who indulge in it will become more and more ungodly. Boy, that's a word for us. Their their teaching will spread like gangrene. Among them are Hymenaeus and uh, Philetus, 
who have departed from the truth. They say that the resurrection has already taken place and they destroy the faith of some. Nevertheless, God's solid foundation stands firm, sealed with this inscription. The Lord knows those who are his, and everyone who confesses the name of the Lord must turn away from wickedness. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this opportunity to share key principles to how to study your holy word. I pray, Father, that to this day that you would take away all distractions, all fears, all anxieties. Open our eyes that we may see something afresh in your holy word. Open our ears that we may hear your word clearly. Open our minds that we may understand it and open our hearts that we may be changed. Come, Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to learn several key principles to reading and studying the Bible today. You have a very detailed outline that you can follow along with. I've put together a weekend course on how to study the Bible for all it's worth, which is about a 10-hour course, and Pastor Andy asked me to teach it today. So take your pens and pencils out and your notepads and, and get enough coffee, because over the next 10 hours, we're going to be studying, learning how to study and read the Bible. No, I'm just joking. I am condensing it to about a 30-minute message. So this morning, I'll be teaching more than preaching. Although I teach theology, my main uh, area of specialty is the Holy Spirit or pneumatology. I'm also honored to teach the preaching courses at the School of uh, Divinity at Regent University But I'm not preaching today. We're going to get into the Word. I'm going to teach you the key principles of reading and studying the Bible with purpose. You ready to learn? You really want to learn? I know you do because this is such a great church that loves God and loves the Word. So let me ask you this question. How do you approach the Bible? Do you just grab it and... And go, okay, Holy Spirit, speak to me today. Go and hang thyself. No. <laughs> no. They, they ate till they were gorged. And, he, he, and had given them what they craved. <laughs> That's not a very good scripture, actually. Do we do that? It's called the, the Bible roulette. We just open it up. Sometimes we do that. Sometimes we're so desperate, we just cry out to God, I need a word, and we just turn and we start reading it. Now, sometimes the Holy Spirit will use that, but that's not the main reason. That's not the main way to hear the Lord. There's purposes to read and to study the Word of God. How do we approach the Bible? Do we view the big book with fear in a sense, like I said earlier, that we say to ourselves, there's no way that I'll ever, ever be able to read it, much less understand it? Or we, do we view the Bible as just one of many inspired and spiritual books? I know you don't hear, but there might be some. John Calvin, a great theologian in the Reformation during the 1500s, has, uh, has a great statement about the view of the Bible. Listen to what he says. Now, the, this power of inspiration, which is particular, which is particular to Scripture, is clear from the fact that of human writings, however artfully pub- uh, polished, there's none capable of affecting us at all comparably. Read Demetrius or Circio or Plato or Aristotle and others of that tribe. They will, I admit, allure you, delight you, move you, and rapture you in wonderful measure. But break yourself from them to this sacred reading. Break yourself from them. Betake yourself from them for this sacred reading then. In spite of yourself, so deeply will it affect you, so penetrate your heart, so fix it in your very morrow that compared with this, its deep impression, such vigor as the orators and the philosophers have will nearly vanish away. 
Consequently, it is easy to see that the scriptures, which so far surpass all gifts and graces of human endeavor, breathe something divine. Now, I know that's a long quote, but it's so rich in understanding how to approach the Word of God. The way we view the Word of God and our approach is, an, is part of our attitude in how we approach the Word. What is our attitude? And I'm going to run through these very quickly because of time. And I do want to look at some of the key passages in 2 Timothy. The way we approach God's Word or an attitude toward the world will affect how we receive the Word of God. Some approach the Word to discover special hidden meanings which usually spiritualizes the Word and it's very, very dangerous. Others approach it mainly from the end times eschatological point of view. So every time you're reading, go, oh, this is about the end times. Oh, this is about the end times. And it limits your understanding of the Word. Still others just believe there are several different ways to interpret Scripture and Therefore, everyone's interpretation is correct. I believe this is where most people are because they've never been taught principles, universal principles to Bible study. And this is why Pastor Andy wanted me to teach this morning to bring you a correct way to study and read the Bible. You say, correct? Who are you? Well, I'm just a person just like you. But there are universal principles to Bible study that actually, it's called the inductive Bible study method. But they're universal principles that you teach this all over the world. And I teach this all over the world through Empowered Living International Ministries. We have several Bible schools in Africa and starting some in India. And, and uh, they are guardrails like on a bridge. So that when you study with purpose, when you read with purpose, you ask the right questions. And, and you go through the different questions as you're reading the Bible. We're going to go through some of those today. And they're guardrails so that you don't go off too far to the left or too far to the right. And I'm not talking about liberal or conservative. I'm just saying too far to the left, too far to the right. And what's so beautiful about this, the Holy Spirit, let's say... Uh, uh, Pastor Sam is, Samuel is studying the Word, the same passage. All of us are studying the Word in our, in our small groups. And it's the same passage. You've read it at home, and you're ready to share what the Lord showed you, following these universal principles. This is what's so beautiful. God will show you certain aspects that I didn't see when I was studying it. And I, He will show me some things that that Daniel didn't see studying it. But they're within the, the, the guardrails of sound doctrine when you follow these universal principles. And so there's, there's that freedom here, but never does it go overboard. In other words, when you follow these universal principles, you will correctly handle the word of truth. Isn't that good news? And it's not that hard, actually. So our attitude, our view of the Word, we prepare our minds to study the Word, and we continue to, to um, prepare our hearts by the Holy Spirit for Him to reveal the Word to us. So how do we study the Bible? I'm glad you asked. That's why we're here this morning. And I know this sounds like a lecture, and it is. Okay? That's who I is right now. I was honored to pastor in the Church of Scotland for four years and to pastor here in Hampton Roads for eight years and to pastor in California for a long time as well. And now we're back here, our third time in Hampton Roads. But here are the three key areas of Bible study. Three key areas. Observation. Say observation. observation. What does the Bible say? Not what it means. What does the Bible say? And we're going, this is our main focus today. And then interpretation. Say interpretation. interpretation. What does the passage mean? And then application. Say application. application. How does this passage apply to me and the church today? This is, these are the key areas. These are the guardrails that I was talking about. So let's look at this passage in 2 Timothy that we read. 
It says, keep reminding God's people of these things. So when you're reading a text, you're under the observation. And most of your time of reading is observation. So many times we want to jump right into interpretation or application. And the Holy Spirit says, no, 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 no. I wrote this for you so you can soak in it. So you can read it and allow me to minister to you when you're asking the right questions. Are you with me? So observation. When you read this text and any other text, you begin to ask certain words. And I'm going to use a big word. The first word that we, we learn about in application, if the slide, there we go, is exegesis. Oh, oh, whoa, that's a big word. I know it's a big word. But it just mean, basically means this, all right? It basically means this. Exegesis is the careful, systematic study of the scriptures with the original intended meaning to the best of our ability. That's what it means. What does the passage say, and what does it say to the original hearers of the word? That's what exegesis is. All of you can do that. All of us can do that. This is basically a historical task. It's the attempt to hear the word as the original recipients were, have heard it, and to find out what the original intent of the words of the Bible were and are. That's all the exegesis is. <sighs> Dr. Gilbert, I just don't have the time for this. Yes, you do. If you want to get to know God, the God of the Bible, this love letter was written for you. For you to read it so you can understand it and to grow in love with God through his holy word. With the guidance of the Holy Spirit. You see, in these principles we learn on exegesis, key principles observation is the context is key. Context is key. The historical literary context. Historical context just means what is the history of this book? If any good study Bible, this is a good study Bible that I use, any good, and I didn't bring my um, NIV study Bible because it's fallen apart, <laughs> literally. It literally has fallen apart. So this is my new study Bible. I use a different translation now. But, um, so any good study Bible, the very beginning of the book that you're reading, the, the scholars have written out the historical context. So just take five minutes and read. Like in Timothy, this is in Timothy here in this study text, study Bible. Uh, Second Timothy only has a very short introduction because First Timothy, the other uh, scholars write quite a bit about uh, what happened. All you do, just read it. It has the author and the title. It has the date, r approximate date. Uh, what's the theme? It gives you the theme. Uh, so it gives you the purpose and the occasion of the book. So this gives you all the historical context or the, the general aspects of it. And it gives you a greater understanding. Oh, that's why. That's why P uh, Paul is writing Timothy about this. Because of these false teachers that have entered into the church. And there's ca they're causing disruption. Oh, I didn't know. I didn't understand that. So just take five minutes to read uh, uh, the introduction of each book that you're going to read. And you can read it devotionally. That's the thing. God wants us to read it devotionally, but he wants us to read it with purpose. The historical context. Who, what, when, where, why, how. We're going to get to those in a second. And, and we study it that way. We read it that way. And when we do, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, the Bible becomes alive when we read it with purpose. When we're reading it, with these questions that we're asking. Oh, I didn't realize. You know, when you're reading this, you go, uh, warn them about God, uh, warn them before God against quarreling about words. Now, why did Paul write Timothy that? Because these false teachers were coming in and using all this, this Greek and ph philosophical words as well as some biblical words and phrases and causing them to quarrel over them. And causing confusion. Now, God is not the God of confusion. Who's the God of confusion? The devil is. And he wants to bring confusion in the church. So, 
Well, this word really doesn't mean that, so it, it means this. No, it doesn't. It means this. No, it doesn't. It means that. Well, I'm going to hold to Gilbert's view of that word. Well, I'm going to hold to Pastor Mead's view of that word, and now we're in division. That's exactly what was happening in the early church, and in, in the church of, this is the church of Ephesus that Paul taught, founded and taught for three to three and a half years. The book of Ephesians is the book that Timothy is now the pastor of, the church that Timothy is now the pastor of. And so he says, stop quarreling about these words. In another passage, he says, stop quarreling about times and, and traditions and practices that take away from Jesus Christ. So that's just, that's just observation, historical context. Then we, we look at literary context. Is this didactic? Didactic just means is it a teaching book? Is this a teaching packet passage? Or is it poetry? Is it a parable? Is it historical? Is it, um, uh, is it law giving? All the, is, are there certain doctrines being taught in this passage? So these are all observation questions. By the way, I know I'm running really fast because I'm looking at the clock and we have another service. But I, I'm hoping this is drawing you to understand a hunger for the word. When you start asking the right questions nev in, in, in the historical and literary context, you understand the first key is this. The first key is never take a scripture out of its context to make it say something contrary to the text. That happens all the time today. Matter of fact, one of the biggest issues that the church is dealing with is that we try to read the Bible we try to read the Bible from the 21st century mindset and then take and push it and force it onto the correct mindset which is the Holy Word does that make sense so if we're struggling with a particular sin that we don't want to uh, repent of then we go well well I was just created this way and so I'm going to read the scripture uh, that says that this lifestyle is opposed to godly and holy living. Well, it, it doesn't really mean that. You see, we do it all the time. And it, listen, it perverts the word of God. It, it's adulterating the word of God. Listen, it's prostituting the word of God. Those are harsh words, Dr. Gilbert. Yes, they are. Because this is a holy word. This is a holy Bible. We're not to read the Bible from our understanding and our culture into the Bible. That takes it out of the context to make it mean what it never meant. Are you with me? So when Paul says, he says this, do your own... Um, Second Timothy, he says, warn them before God against quarreling. It is of no value and only ruins those who listen. Verse 15, do your best to present yourself to God and as one approved. Now, observation. Do you not think that God wants not just Timothy but you and me to really strive in understanding the word? Because that's what he's telling him. Now, if you know the Greek, it's actually be so zealous of striving to know the word of God that everything else falls away because you're so hungry to correctly handle the word of truth. Correctly handle the word of truth. I want to be zealous. I want to give you a passion for God's word. I want to give you a passion to hunger and thirst to righteously, righteously and correctly handle the word of truth properly. And you start with context of the passage. Context of the passage. And the literary context is those different, dif different ways or different literature. Like I said, poetry or song. Or, or apocalyptic, all these terms. If you have questions about those, you can talk to me after the service. So what was going on at the time of the writing? What's the historical setting, and why was Paul or the, or the, or the author addressing the people? 
So never take scripture out of its context to make it say something contrary to the text. Another principle is read with purpose. Read with purpose. And these are what you learned in English class. Well, maybe you don't learn that anymore in English. <laughs> um, those are in high school and all that. This is called English. When you read any book, you ask these questions. You know, I'm, I'm not being facetious. That's really happened. Most students don't know how to read. Do you know the average, sidebar, do you know the average uh, senior in high school reads on a sixth grade level? Sixth grade level. Who, what, when, where, why, how. Just ask those. When you're reading the Bible, just have these right by your side in your notebook or whatever. Just have, okay, who, who is the author writing to? Or who is Jesus speaking to? Or, you know, all those who's. What? What is this about? What is it this? What, what is happening at this time? Why? Why is this written? Or why did Jesus say this to the person? Why did Jesus say this uh, parable? When? Where? Where was this happening? What's the uh, geographical location? All these are good questions. You don't have to go through it like that every time, but this just gives you purpose in reading. And how? How? What's going on? So these are so important. There's some false teachers in the church, as I said earlier, taking the church and misusing the Word of God, bringing confusions and others. Others are, were focused on certain words and terms. This is the beginning of Gnosticism and spiritualizing the Word and, and denying the very resurrection of Jesus Christ as well as uh, saying that it had already come, but spiritualizing it and denying it. It's a false teaching, and Paul is strict with sound doctrine. We're supposed to correctly handle the word of truth, and that's by reading it with purpose. There's so much for us to learn. So interpretation. There's so much more about application of, of uh, observation. By the way, if you want to go deeper, after the service, we have all, not all, but the majority of the questions about observation, front and back. It's a free gift for all of you. And later on this, this week, it will be uploaded on the website so you can download it or send it to your friends. This leads you to understand the Holy Word in a greater way. Second is interpretation. What does the passage mean? What does it say and then what does it mean? And this is where context rules. What does the author, the author's original intent and meaning have to say? Whoops, I hit the wrong one. What's the author have to, uh, the original intent and meaning? to the audience he was addressing. Here's a key text I mentioned again. A text cannot mean what it never meant. A text cannot mean what it never meant. Are you with me? And then another key. Don't start with the here and now to interpret. I've just uh, talked extensively about that. So what does it mean? The exegesis and context Always seek the full counsel of the word of God. As you're reading it, you may go, wow. He talks about uh, what is the word of truth. The word of truth was the Old Testament scriptures. They already had that. And almost all the gospels, Matthew and Mark for sure, by this time of this writing, and probably Luke, Matthew and Mark for sure, as well as a couple of the letters that Paul wrote that were already viewed as inspired as holy writ. So he's talking about the word of truth, the Old Testament scripture and several of the gospels that were already written and possibly some of his letters. So that's what the word is so rightly correct, correctly handled it. So we see this in interpreting and how to interpret. So don't start with the here and now. This is where we fail. We look at our current life or situation in society or certain issues and then we view scripture from our perspective and not the author's perspective from the Holy Spirit. This is so important. All we seek the full counsel of God. And this leads us to another, and we'll be wrapping this up, leads this to the next one, next key principle. All we seek the whole counsel of God and Scripture interprets Scripture. Scripture interprets Scripture. Interpret scripture in the plain sense, sometimes literally, but sometimes it's not literal because it's a allegorical. It's a type of literature that you're reading. 
in these didactic letters, teaching letters from Paul, you take it literally, but you have to look at the context. Paul may be using an illustration. Are you with me? But let Scripture interpret Scripture and take the plain sense. And then the interpret, this is key, interpret the Old Testament. Interpret the Old Testament in light of the New. Interpret the Old Testament in light of the New. And do not build a doctrine on an obscure passage. The Mormons have done this throughout. The Mormons, for example, they baptize for the dead. For one verse in Corinthians, Paul talks about that. And I don't know one scholar that fully understands that. And yet, the Mormons, which is a cult, have developed a whole doctrine over that obscure verse. Don't do it. And let me close with application. Who's ever read, been reading the Word, you're just reading it, and all of a sudden a scripture jumps off the page at you and just really ministers to your heart? Is that anybody? Yeah. You know, this is really important. I, that is a word from the Holy Spirit to you. To you. But it's not for you to teach and make a teaching out of. Do you see the difference? Because if, you, if that scripture jumps off at you and ministers to you for a certain situation you're going through, that's the Holy Spirit saying, I'm making the word alive outside of keeping the context, historical and literary context and all that, because you need a touch from me, and I, need to, and I want to give you a promise to stand on for your situation, and only for you. Are you with me? If you take that and say, boy, God showed me what this word really means, and this is why, this is why we're doing this, and this is what it means. Well, you've just completely read into Scripture what it never meant. Are you with me? So this is key. I never want to keep you from saying, oh, well, the Holy Spirit doesn't speak that way because Dr. Gilbert said, I have to follow this. Right? That's devotional reading. Some would call that rhema word. It jumps off the page, but it's for you not for anybody else and it's not for you to go and make a whole teaching out of a lot of charismatics like myself do that and it perverts the word of God did you hear me so we apply it we ask the right questions about application well I've run out of time I got so excited about the beginning that I ran out of time about how to apply it but there's slides and you have your notes do you want me to fill it out for you real quick let me see well apply uh, the word how does it apply to me in the church K. author says this no matter how much you know about God's word if you don't apply what you learn scripture will never benefit your life that's what I want you to do I want you to read with purpose and I know we haven't I mean I wanted to really get into the text in 2nd Timothy because it's so rich but I felt I really just needed to give you the overall principles to help you really begin to dig into the word this is what I want you to do as we close like I said earlier I've put together a little observation page front and back I want you as the church to take this with you and this week every day read Colossians chapter 3 verses 1 to 17 it's one of my favorite passages Colossians 3 1 to 17 and just take your time all week just read it read it and read it and allow the Holy Spirit prepare your heart Holy Spirit show me the meaning but show me what it's saying first and just do all the observations and as you do the observations, the Holy Spirit is going to give you the interpretation, I promise. And the Bible is going to become so alive like never before. And you're going, whoa, I'm to crucify my flesh daily and put aside anger and wrath and malice and slander and abuses from my life. Abuse of speech from my life. I'm, I'm to crucify the flesh and put to death immorality, impurity, lust, evil desire, and greed, which amounts to idolatry. How do I do that? 
the Holy Spirit shows you as you just study. So this week, this is your homework, your assignment. I'll be back, and I'll be grading you next week. No. Just take the time. Study. Read. Colossians 3, 1 to 17 every day. And just have a notebook. And just start following these questions. And I promise you, your life will be changed through the Word of God. Now, there is opportunity for everybody to be touched. I've gone over. I want to pray specifically for those that may never know Jesus, that don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Before you can really understand the Word, you have to know the author of the Word, Jesus Christ, who is the Word, the Logos, right? So let's bow our heads and let's ask God to touch you right now. Father, thank you so much for these wonderful saints. Thank you for all that are here and those that are watching online. Bless them all. But Lord, there might be one or two people or ten people or even a hundred people here or those online that have never made a profession of faith to you. And right now, Father, I ask you, because it is your will, that you would send the Holy Spirit and, and touch their hearts and convict them of sin and reveal to them that Jesus is the only way to salvation and life eternal as well as abundant life now. So right now, if, if something's tugging at your heart, maybe you've been away from the Lord and it's time for you to recommit your life to the Lord. Or maybe you've never made a commitment to Jesus Christ. Pray this with me. You can pray it. Just mean it from your heart. And those watching online, just, just pray this prayer. Something like this. Say, oh God, I want to know your word like never before. But I don't understand it because I don't know you. I do believe that Jesus Christ lived a sinless life. And suffered and died on the cross for my sins, my guilt, my shame, my hurt, and my pain. And I need to be set free from all this. I believe he died on the cross for me. And I do believe, Father, that he physically rose from the dead. And therefore, I confess Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior right now. Now, Holy Spirit, I ask you to fill me up. Come into my life and change me. And let me come to know, not just you, but know your word. In Jesus' name. If you said that prayer, 